I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can join our mailing list and access premium content at CapitalAllocators.com. Three years ago, we released a mini-series entitled Sustainable Investing, The Next Frontier to explore the early landscape for ESG. In the ensuing years, a lot of investor attention has focused on sustainable investing, but differing objectives, measurements, and benchmarks has muddied the playing field. It's a subject I wrote about in a blog last year called What's in a Name? The Problem with ESG. So until those cloudy waters clear up, I thought about turning our attention to a nearly universal area of interest, how capital allocation can improve the climate. This four-part miniseries spans conversations with leading practitioners focusing on climate solutions. We'll hear from hedge fund and climate activist legend Tom Steyer, one of the most long-standing and largest family offices focused on impact investing, and two important strategies in the space, nuclear power and carbon credits. Taken together, we'll learn how some of the top investment minds are working actively to address our long-term climate needs. My guest on the first episode of Climate Solutions is Tom Steyer, the founder and former head of Farallon Capital Management, climate activist, candidate for president of the United States in 2020, and most recently, co-founder of Galvanize Climate Solutions, a mission-driven investment platform addressing urgent climate solutions. Our conversation covers Tom's early career and founding of Farallon in 1986. We discuss his original strategy, history, and succession to new leaders at the firm. We then turn to Tom's retirement from Farallon, work on the environment, and presidential run. From there, we dive into Tom's return to the investment business at Galvanize, covering his investment thesis, strategies to deploy, and creation of another investment organization today. All the way through, Tom shares a lifetime's worth of investing and business wisdom. Before we get going, we found another reason to ask you to spread the word from recently released research out of the University of York and BBC. They found that 71% of podcast listeners discover shows through referrals from friends and family. In other words, pretty much everything we've tried to grow the podcast audience is dwarfed by your enthusiasm in telling others just how amazing this show is. So next time you have the opportunity to talk about capital allocators to your friends, colleagues, family, siblings, dog walkers, bartenders, FedEx drivers, or local baristas at Starbucks, please have at it. But that's not all the research uncovered. It turns out that people are most engaged with podcasts when listening in the comfort of their homes, while warm, and on weekday evenings. So before you get ready for your work week, snuggle up at home on Sunday night and have a listen. I guess that means you might not enjoy listening as much on Monday morning while taking a cold shower after your workout in the gym, but don't let that stop you. Thanks so much for spreading the word. Please enjoy this fascinating conversation with Tom Steyer in the first episode of Climate Solutions. Tom, it's great to see you. It's been a really long time. (laughs) It has indeed. And you've been up to a whole bunch of things in the interim, it seems. Tom, why don't we go all the way back to your formative years in the investment business? When I went to Stanford Business School, my summer job between the two years of business school was working in an investment firm called General Atlantic. And they were the only investment group, as far as I knew, that was hiring summer people from Stanford Business School. So they had one job and I applied and I got it. And I had previously worked for two years as a mergers and acquisition analyst at Morgan Stanley out of college. And I'd spent one summer working as a research analyst at a investment bank called Kidder Peabody. So I knew the difference between investing and investment banking. And I was very intent on being on the investing side. That was what I was interested in. 
And what was it that first got you to know that you wanted to be on the investment side? It was not a carefully thought out logical plan, I assure you, Ted. When I was 19 years old, I worked on a cattle ranch outside Gardnerville, Nevada for the summer. I got paid 100 bucks a month. I worked six days from eight to five, milking two cows before breakfast and two cows after dinner. It works out to about 36 cents an hour. But when I got back home, I said to my father, look, these ranches are not businesses. They live, as far as I can tell, to buy equipment from John Deere and International Harvester. And I would like to buy stock in John Deere and International Harvester because it's very clear to me about who's making all the money out of these ranches. And it's not the people who you think it is. And I think I bought literally eight shares of John Deere, which was I could afford, and 12 shares of International Harvester. Being an investor was not something that someone told me to do or that I thought of. In 1974, I was 16 years old. I think that was the year that the famous New York Post headline was Ford to City Drop Dead, and New York City almost went bankrupt and was a mess. So I'm 17 years old going to high school. And I said to my father, so we're living in the middle of New York City, and there was a very nice townhouse, which in Manhattan, there are very few nice townhouses, and they're super expensive. And it was for sale for $40,000, which even then was ridiculous. And I said, father, we should definitely, it's three houses away from us. We're living in an apartment building. I said, we should buy that. There's no question. Jesus, that's a great buy. And he said, I don't want to live in a townhouse, Tom, because in an apartment building, someone else does the maintenance. In a townhouse, I'm the maintenance man. And I don't really feel like fixing the electricity and the plumbing. (laughs) But my point being, it wasn't like I made a conscious decision ever to be an investor. It was just like, okay, some people think that way. My father was probably much smarter than I was. He just didn't think that way. So going back to your second year business school after having the experience at General Atlantic, you land at Goldman. I could have gone back to General Atlantic and for a variety of reasons, which turned out I was too short-sighted about because General Atlantic turned out to be a fantastic place to work. They did an amazing job and I have the utmost respect and very long-term friendships with the people from GA. Goldman was hiring one person into the risk arb group and the risk arb group basically was investing the equity money on behalf of the partners in the context of a 33 to one brokerage firm. And they'd had a great record through the 70s, which the 1970s were a total mess from an investment standpoint because it was a time of hyperinflation. And they came from the go-go 60s and the nifty 50, and they just got decimated. But the Goldman Arb Group managed to make money every year through the 70s. And I knew that. And so I had a ton of respect for them. They had four people and they're going to hire a fifth person to be low person on the totem pole, namely Moa. <laughs> I knew that Bob Rubin both had a great reputation financially and a great reputation in terms of being a dedicated and involved Democrat. And I thought it would be a great job. So I interviewed for it and got it. What'd you learn in those early years on Bob's desk? A lot. They had a very strong philosophy about how to think about investing. The Warren Buffettism applied in different ways, but first rule of investing is don't lose money. Second rule of investing is don't forget the first rule. And that had taken them through the 70s, and it really had given them a compound that was really amazing for a lot longer than just the 70s, because that group had been central to Goldman Sachs for a very long time. Bob was a very disciplined, clear, fair boss, best boss I've ever had. was really exceptional. I think they gave me a very clear sense of how to frame an investment situation, but also how to stay current more broadly. And just think it, we looked at all kinds of different things. And a lot of investing is reps, how many things you get to look at and then see what happens so you can do pattern recognition. So there was a lot of that. I'd worked there for something like two years and four months. You know, it was an amazing opportunity to learn. Are there any particular stories or aphorisms that you took away from that that have stuck with you to this day? I'll tell you one management philosophy and then the philosophy about investing. But in terms of management, we would get together to make a decision as a group, five people. He would listen to everybody. He would ask questions. He would make the decision at the end. And that was it. 
It's like, Ted, you don't agree, but we've made the decision and you are now officially 100% on board to that decision and we will proceed with it. And Bob was someone who thought new information requires new consideration. And so if new information comes in that suggests we should adjust, we will adjust and we'll have a conversation about it. And he was always very clear about it, but he was also very clear that we're going to make a decision. I'm going to make the decision and you were going to go along with it. And there was a guy from outside the group and we did this. We're trying to make a decision about how to proceed on an investment. And he made his pitch that we should go route B. Bob chose route A, done, ready to roll. And the guy goes, well, I really don't agree with that. And Bob said, okay, I can understand that. We're going to do it your way. If you're wrong, you're fired. And the guy's like, okay, we're going to do it your way. (laughs) (laughs) He was tough but extremely clear, extremely fair. What that guy had to say was completely dumb. I was only 26 years old. I was thinking, oh man, dude, seriously? (laughs) But the other thing I think is true. In investing, you don't get paid for degree of difficulty. Making a straightforward, good investment that you have high confidences is good. You don't have to do the triple flip half gainer in investing to make a good decision. You can make a simple decision. Degree of difficulty. Difficulty is bad. So in a relatively short period of time at a young age, you set out and started Farallon. What was your thinking and decision process to doing that at the time? The real question is, why would I want to leave Goldman Sachs, which was the premier investment bank in the world, actually? I think that's continued to be true. And a place where I think everybody at Goldman, including me, thought that I would make much more money and take much less risk staying where I was. But there were a couple things. I wanted to move back to the West Coast because I'd gone to Stanford and I was engaged to somebody from the West Coast. So there was a huge draw to move West. Bob Rubin, who was the person to whom I had the personal loyalty had gone from running four people to running half the firm two years later or something was going to be running the whole firm so that my connection to the group was completely different. I didn't realize this at the time either, Ted. So who knew? I think that I was comfortable with the idea that if I was going to fail at Goldman Sachs and do a bad job of investing, they would dump me. If I went out on my own and did a bad job of investing, the investors would dump me. But in one case, I would have a little more control. I felt like I'm going to take the same risk at Gulp. They're still going to dump me if I do a bad job. (laughs) So I might as well do it on my own behalf. My last year at Goldman Sachs, just to put it in a context of investment, I was running half of the investments for the art group. They paid me one-tenth of 1% of the income from the art group. I thought it was a little low. (laughs) So what was the path to launching a hedge fund back in 86 when you started? So first of all, no one did it. No one left Goldman to do that ever. They were furious at me for leaving and really, really, really annoyed. When I asked two different people if they would basically back me with limited partner money, one of them was a firm in San Francisco where the number three person was my old roommate called Hellman and Friedman. And I think they guaranteed me $8 million of LP money. And one of my good friends at GA said they would go on the hook for $5 million of LP money. Helman Friedman was on the West Coast. Eight is more than five. (laughs) It's about as complicated as it was. So in those early years, what strategy did you set out to do? We were doing a lot of arbitrage. I didn't call myself a hedge fund. I thought that a hedge fund was a macro fund. And to this day, a hedge fund is a structure, not a strategy. I think hedge fund in common parlance means financial speculator. And you can throw in rapacious, go-go financial speculator if you'd like. (laughs) That's the implications. What I was doing was something very, very different than that. I was trying to do arbitrage, distress, deep value, things where I felt like we were obeying Warren Buffett's first rule of investing, don't lose money. And so we were looking at things with a very specific outcome in mind over a period of time with an expected return where you're betting on outcomes, not on beta. Our opinion was we should have very, very low beta 
it was a very unpopular or little known strategy when we started, maybe as a result of my big fat mouth, it got to be better known and more popular, which meant that we were always having to innovate new strategies because once a financial strategy is known, then people put money into it. And that means there's more on the demand side than there was before. And if it works more, it gets commoditized. And so we were always having to come up with new ideas and new markets and new ways of thinking to apply the same approach. When we met in the early 90s, Farallon was a dozen or two dozen people basically sitting around the same table, actively investing. And it became, over the subsequent decades, much, much more than that. Well, part of that had to do with size in terms of how much money we were investing. We, in general, weren't taking positions that were infinitely large. It wasn't like buying IBM. You can buy $1,000 of IBM or you could buy $100 million of IBM. We were doing investments that you couldn't do an unlimited amount of. So you needed more people to make more investments. That was one reason. The other reason is we did more and more new things. And if you're going to be good in a market, you have to be focused on that market. You can't do it out of your hip pocket. So as we did new things, we needed to have more people to do each vertical. Thirdly, one of the things that was happening, it's hard to remember or imagine in 2023, but Goldman Sachs, which was, as I said, I think the premier investment bank in the world when I worked there in 1983 to 1985, had zero people in China and two people in Hong Kong. And they would say, do you want the banker or the broker? <laughs> they had a Japan desk, but other than that, that was their Asian team. I don't know what the numbers are now, but there are thousands in Hong Kong and thousands in Shanghai, not two. It's hard to remember how parochial the different markets were. So as we moved into different markets and we ended up having a pretty big London team and teams in Asia and Latin America, it got to be more people because of hours. You know, do you really want to be covering Hong Kong between 11 at night and nine in the morning? You just can't do that. So you have to basically build teams in Japan and around the world. What did you learn about building those teams in both different capabilities and geographies over the years? Well, what I knew from the beginning is you can't fake excellence. If you're going to hire somebody, if they're not excellent coming in, they're not going to do an excellent job. That is an overwhelming fact of life. And that is something that I'm not sure everybody believes right now, but that is something that I absolutely 100% believe. The other thing that I think is true that people underestimate in my mind is that character is destiny. If I say you've got to be smart enough, and it's not just smarts, it's something more than smarts. It's intelligence slash judgment. You have to have them. But then you don't have to know too much financial history to find out that character is destiny and that if somebody's not straight, they're not straight and it's going to come out and it's going to be terrible. And that's something that you cannot be too careful about. If you look back at Farallon today, the great success and juggernaut it's been, there's always bumps along the road. And I'd love to hear, what was that one time where you're really wondering how you're going to get through a tough situation? Well, it's hard to exaggerate how tumultuous the markets were in the 80s and 90s. I mean, it was incredible. Our market had a huge upchuck in November of 1986, which was our first year, where the Wall Street scandals broke and they arrested the biggest arbitrageur, Ivan Bosky, who went to jail. And no one knew what was going on or what was going to happen. So all of the so-called arm stocks, people just sold them as fast as they could, which means that they all went down a ton. And so from Friday to Monday, every position we owned went down a lot. And that was in our first year of operation, thinking we were doing a great job and getting great returns. It was like, oh my God, a completely exogenous, unpredictable event has just made us look very stupid. And then the second year, 1987, was the year of the crash. And I convinced myself by looking at market history that 
Black Thursday in 1929. That's as bad as it can be. And that's the precursor to the Great Depression. It's not going to be worse than the Great Depression, for God's sake. It was like two and a half times worse on a market basis. I literally did not sleep a whole night for six months after that. I would just wake up at two or three in the morning upset, and I'd stay upset until I went to work at five in the There was a bunch of other things that happened along the way. And each time it would be very, very emotionally concerning because we were basically telling people the market's not going to impact us. We're doing things that aren't driven by the GDP return this year or interest rates this year or the direction of the market this year. In a real upchuck, everything gets it. In your last couple of years, before you retired from Farallon, you had a very different stage of the business, much more institutionalization. And then you were in this process of trying to figure out succession. Would love to hear your thoughts on how that period was different from what you had experienced until then. In some ways, I had built what I was looking to build, which was a lot of really good teams of smart people who are expert in their area, who could be relied on in many ways to be independent and who were trustworthy and good and that we had a lot of money under management. We had a lot of relationships that were enduring and strong. And we built a machine that kicked off a bunch of cash. And we felt like we were doing a good job for our clients and it was lucrative for us. What was also true was I was no longer able to do what I'd been able to do probably for the first 10 years of the business, which was walk around and see everybody. At Stanford Business School, one of the things they talked about was that HP way, the Hewlett Packard way of doing management, which was management by walking around. And that meant I could walk around literally and see you and say, hey, Ted, what are you working on? Or Ted, you look upset. Is something the matter? And you could say, yeah, we just lost our babysitter for tonight. Or you could say, yes, we just heard news on this investment. It's an absolute disaster. And we could have a conversation. You could say, I'm thinking about what to do about this. And we could have an informal conversation about how to frame that and what we should care about and blah, 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 which I really enjoy. And to a very large extent, because of the nature, and I think this is true of Fairlawn, but I think it's true of organizations. If you get beyond 125 people, you really can't manage informally. You have to have systems and processes and hierarchies and rules. I found that a lot less fun. That took me, in effect, a step away from the investments because there are just too many people and too many investments. So they'd really only bring me in when there was a problem. That's a less rewarding way to act when you have less strong personal relationships and you're further from actual investment decision making or tangentially involved in the decision. And so I felt for a while In any rational level, it's actually exactly what you want in terms of producing income for yourself from a selfish standpoint. But when I left Goldman, they said, you will never make as much money anywhere as here, Tom, you're a fool. And I was like, you're probably right. I agree. (laughs) But that's not how I want to live my life based on my net present value going forward. And I felt the same way at Fairline, which is I want to live a life. I don't want to maximize my income. I want to live a life that I find meaningful and rewarding. And I felt like this has pulled me away from the things that I actually enjoy the most. So you've been out for 10 years and Farallon is still thriving today. There are a lot of firms still led by their founder that may have started around when you did in the business. How did you make that succession work? Well, there were a couple of things that were true that made it possible. One is I was very clear for years before I left at the end of 2012, that the person who was going to take over was Andrew Spokes. And so that was no surprise to anybody. I said it for eight years beforehand. He was someone who I still have a very close personal relationship with, still feel as if I understand him intellectually and from the standpoint of integrity. And I was not worried about either. So that is the first step for understanding. And then the real question was, What would the transition look like? Would some people not like to work in a firm where Andrew was going to be the CEO slash CIO? Would some of the people who were our clients feel as if I weren't there, that it would be materially different? And But they'd all had such a long period of time 
really, we did it for over such a long period of time, Ted. And Andrew's a very articulate, trustworthy person. I think overall people, both inside and outside, figured that out so that it wasn't that tumultuous. I don't think they really missed a step and I don't think it was pretty seamless. So when you stepped away, did you have a plan at the time? No, I had a focus, but not a plan. I felt as if the natural world is deteriorating and we're going to have to change the way we as a species, we as a country, we as an economy interact with the natural world. And that's going to involve a change in the way that we think about that relationship and a change in the way that we build things, use things, a dramatic change in attitude and activity. And that that's going to be a long conversation in America and around the world. And I'd like to be part of the people pushing for a more aggressive, robust, positive response. We have presumably one chance at life. And so I wanted to participate in what I perceived as the overwhelming threat slash opportunity for change. Was that always a passion of yours? sustainability is much broader than just climate change, even though that's the leading edge of the wedge. I see that in the context of human suffering. Ted. It's not a question of, am I worried about the end of the elm tree or the elm of the snail darter? Do I care about those? Sure. But why do I care about those? Mostly because of their impact on other human beings. <laughs> and so when I look at this, I look at it in the context of avoiding almost unimaginable human suffering, mostly borne by people who had nothing to do with causing it, by and large, completely innocent, but are going to undergo privation and destruction almost more than we can imagine if we don't do the right thing. Have I always cared about other human beings? I hope so. <laughs> so that initial thesis about wanting to do something about this, where did that take you? It really evolved because I thought, okay, this is a tech problem. We need to have better technology to do this. And so I, in some sense, invested, in some sense, donated money to different research institutions, basically schools, universities, to do research. So we won in the marketplace so people no longer use destructive machines and lifestyles. I thought it was really a tech problem. And then I really thought it was a understanding problem. And I spent a lot of time doing intentionally nonpartisan efforts at consciousness raising with some very prominent Republicans, including George Schultz and Hank Paulson. And Mike Bloomberg did some stuff. And he's been a Republican as well as an independent and a Democrat but trying to bring in the business community to say, this is not a partisan issue. This is just a challenge for humanity. And so we need to respond as a broad-based group, understanding that, of course, it's a societal problem, but it's also an economic problem in terms of the transition. Nobody wants to go back in a cave and rub two sticks together. How the economy responds and how capitalism and commerce responds is really important. So I wanted to make sure that business people weren't there saying, this is all a bunch of pointy-headed, unrealistic, liberal do-gooders who don't know anything about how the world really works, whereas we, the big boys, we know how the world works. <laughs> what did you find from those two efforts, both funding the kind of technology and research and increasing awareness? Well, I think by and large, the funding, the research was worth it. That in fact, what we've seen is that a whole bunch of great companies have come out of some of that research. It took a lot longer than I would have hoped, Ted, to go from a very smart grad student with an idea to a billion dollar company, but it has happened. I think it's been meaningful. I feel pretty proud of that. The number of companies that have come out of that, particularly out of the Stanford Tomcat Center, I'm really, we're first money into an awful lot of successful companies. I think that the work that we did, basically pushing nonpartisan groups of economically sophisticated people, so that's CEOs and economists and sophisticated political people, to say this is good business, this is good economics, this is very doable, 
We did a bunch of different things, but I think that people are now making those points and it's eight or 10 years later. I've always been skeptical and afraid of the status quo. You're in charge of everything. I run a $2 trillion bank, Ted. How dare you disagree with me, given how much smarter and more informed I am than you? How dare you even bring it up? That's always been something that I've wanted to forestall because I've never believed that those people had a monopoly on wisdom. I want to dive into what you're doing again on the investment side, but I guess there is some slight diversion we should talk about your experience running for president of the United States. We'd just love to hear what you experienced in that time. So first of all, why I did it, I did it because I didn't think anybody was talking about the issues that were most important in America, including specifically climate, but also including racial justice, including term limits, kind of the ossification of our system. I really didn't intend to run. I'd said I wasn't going to run. And then I was like, oh my God, they keep talking about the key issue in this primary campaign seems to be whether we're going to have single payer healthcare, which anyone with a brain in their head knows we're not going to have single payer healthcare. So why don't we stop talking about it and start talking about something important like what's going on in the United States of America, not what the people in Washington, D.C. want to talk about today, but actually get down to the stuff that's going to change lives, which is going to determine the future of our country. That was why I felt like, oh my God, this is ridiculous. <laughs> but let me say that unbelievably fun. People always say it's so grueling. I was like, really? You think this is grueling? Get a job. <laughs> it's not grueling. It's super fun. You get to learn so much. You get such a broad exposure to people across the country on a very direct basis, which is incredible. I'm such a fan of Americans, such an immense fan of the people of this country and how much they know and how decent they are. I learned so much. And, you know, I traveled the country a lot pushing on climate for years, but I really honestly loved it and felt it was one of the most joyous and rewarding things I've ever done. Honestly, I just love when people go, it's so hard. Really? You think it's hard? <laughs> To meet Americans and learn about the country and get a firsthand understanding of what it is to be a nurse in Las Vegas, what it is to live next door to a chemical plant, how you think about having a kid with this problem. Not everyone would agree with me, and that's fine. It's a democracy. You get a right not to agree with each other. That's not a problem. But if you listen to each other, you're much smarter at the end. And so I found it just such an immense privilege to get out and have that experience with other Americans. It just couldn't have been more fun. What was the biggest difference between what you thought you knew and then having this experience where, as you said, you're traveling the country, meeting the rest of America? The thing that I really didn't understand that I think I understand better is the context for what does it mean if we're having this conversation? Why does that matter? I think I learned a lot about how at least the Democratic Party's political system works and how it's organized. Because, of course, another word for politics is just organization. And there's a lot of organizing behind what you see on TV or what you see at a rally and how that gets reflected at the ballot box. And that part, even though I thought I knew a reasonable bit about it, I definitely learned an awful lot. What's been your path from then? until getting back into the investment business? Well, I spent probably 10 months doing two things. One was running the Economic Recovery Task Force for California, for Governor Newsom. And at the same time, I was also doing a lot in terms of climate outreach for the Biden campaign. And so I did a bunch on that as well. Between those two things, that was a more than full-time job for 10 months. And when that was over, then I was like, okay, now how can I impact the things I care the most about in a way that I can enjoy? Because if I don't enjoy it, then I probably won't do it that long and it probably won't be that meaningful in terms of impact. And I feel as if we're at the execution phase of the climate crisis. We've talked about it. We've won the argument. Everybody knows what we have to do, but we actually have to do it. 
And so I felt like we're not prepared to do it. And I can be, as I felt I was in terms of winning the conversation, I can be on the right side of this argument. I can participate in this argument. I can be part of the solution. And that's a meaningful thing for me to do in my estimation and something. I would say to people about what I'm doing now, which is investing in climate solutions. I say, if I weren't doing this, I would be eating my heart out because I wanted to do it. So as you decided to dive into this, What is the core argument for why investing in climate solutions is a productive thing to do today? Well, I think there are two basic points here. One is, of course, if we don't change the way we live, we will destroy the natural world, which will in turn come around and destroy us. That has to happen. I don't see that as a questionable thesis. But I also believe that that's a huge investment thesis, that in fact, The urgency, the need means that we will have to rebuild our economy in a different way and it will be pervasive and it will be very lucrative. If it doesn't scale, if it isn't really lucrative, then we're not going to change the world because that's how capitalism works. You don't scale stuff that doesn't work. That gives a huge incentive for it to work and a huge demand driver. And so I believe what's like the IT revolution. In 1996, people used to talk about the internet companies like eBay, and AOL, the internet companies, the companies that are internet focused. But as a friend of mine who was a venture capitalist said in 1996, Tom, every company in America is going to be an internet company. The internet is a tool for delivering information, goods, and services. You're not an electricity company because you lose electricity. You're not an internet company because you use the internet. Every company is going to use the internet in a huge way. And that's going to just be part of the fabric of American business, which it is. And the same is true of climate. Every company, Exxon is going to be a climate company. No question about it. There are a lot of ways that you could think about participating in that from an investment perspective. You mentioned at the onset, some technology investments. You've had your historical investing on risk-protected investing. How did you decide to tackle it? Basically, we're trying to set up investment vehicles that suit specific categories of investors and also have discernible, measurable, positive climate impacts. Unless that's true, we just won't do it. We want to have better than market returns and we want to have measurable impact. We want to have both. And we believe that having measurable impact And riding this wave of climate awareness and climate transition will be very, very profitable. There are a lot of things that come up when people try to figure out how they want to participate in this. And the first is usually the use of fossil fuels. After what happened this year in Ukraine, there's more of an understanding that we can't just shut off fossil fuels in the path to transition. How have you thought about fossil fuels as part of or an exclusion of investment strategy? As you said, Ted, it's a transition. We can't just say tomorrow, no more oil and gas, no more coal. We can't because people freeze. If you're trying to avoid imaginable human suffering, the best way I can think of is not by starting by making people freeze to death. Having said which, I believe the lesson that people draw from Ukraine is not the one you said. So let's talk about Ukraine for a second, why that shows how this transition can and should go. So first of all, obviously, what had happened was a lot of Western Europe relied on Russia for the natural gas that they used to heat their houses specifically in the winter, so that when it's cold in Germany or cold in Switzerland in January, that they're reliant on natural gas flowing from Russia, and that therefore that emboldened Vladimir Putin to think that he could, in effect, blackmail them with the fear of freezing to death. And so when you say that we're relying on fossil fuels, they made a choice to rely on a specific source of natural gas. And so for people who don't understand exactly how natural gas works, and I'm probably in that category, but I understand a little bit how natural gas works, it's not transportable the way that gasoline is to your local gas station. It has to be directly delivered in a pipeline from someplace. It's a gas. It's traditionally been a regional product. So the price of natural gas, the exact same substance in Japan, could be literally 
10 times the cost of natural gas in Texas, easily. And in fact, in this case, when Putin basically was trying to blackmail the Europeans, the price was a lot more than 10x difference. But what happened as a result was the people in Northern Europe, specifically the Germans, who had made what turned out to be not a great decision to trust the natural gas from Russia, have accelerated their moves away from that, accelerated the move away from fossil fuels, the price of gas that's down 40% or something in Europe. The price of natural gas in the United States is less than half what it was three or four months ago. In fact, what we're seeing is that it is a transition, but we're going to have to get off fossil fuels. Do I think that that's something where we're going to go to zero? We're trying to get to net zero, not zero by 2050. And net zero implies that we'll continue to emit CO2 or CO2 equivalents, and that we will also suck carbon out of the air and stick it someplace in the ocean or in the ground. And that between what we suck out of the air and what we put into the air, it will be a net zero. But when we talk about fossil fuels in the transition, look, we don't have a choice about whether we make this transition. Obviously, we have to be smart in terms of understanding in a transition, you have to take care of people along the way. You have to make it possible for them to live. But you can't be building 40-year infrastructure because once you've built that infrastructure, once you spent $5 billion building a pipeline from point A to point B, when I say, okay, no more natural gas, you're going to have a fit. (laughs) And you're going to say it's unfair and it's misreading and you're an idiot and you're not a big boy and the big boys know we have to do this. And it's really like, I don't want to lose $5 billion. Who wants to lose $5 billion? So it's really important not to build those because all you're building is political problems for yourself. We have to make this transition. We have to do it as fast as possible. All of the people who own $5 billion pipelines are going to argue that we're stupid, that we don't understand business, that we can't do this. But if you actually look at the cost of electricity, the different kinds of electricity, the two cheapest kinds of electricity are wind and solar. They've moved from saying it's too expensive to do wind and solar to saying they're not dependable. It's like, okay, 10 years ago, you're saying they're too expensive. Now they're a fraction of what you cost, but now they're not dependable. But we have these things called batteries. So guess what? Over the next 10 years, we'll have storage systems that enable us to do long-term storage so that in effect, will it always be a management issue in terms of safety, in terms of storage, and in terms of cost? Yes. Yes, it will. We'll have to actually manage it. But for everybody who says, impossible, it'll never happen. We can never do it. That's just not true. And if you get deep into what's going on in terms of all the different technologies, there's a massive amount of amazingly great stuff. And are we going to have to be smart? Yeah, but that's why we're doing this. That's why I started Galvanize with my partner, Katie Halls, to say, no, yeah, we have to actually do it. But is it doable? Yes, it's doable. Stop. As you're allocating capital to the space, what are the types of opportunities you're looking for? There's what needs to be deployed now. So for instance, as an example, let's say you and I own a big multifamily apartment building. Okay. One of the things we can do is change the glass in the windows so that it requires completely different amounts of electricity for heating and cooling. Okay. And the question is, what's the return on that glass? I was reading a story this morning saying that America's use of oil last year went up 0.6%, I think, or something very minor. But up, the actual use of gasoline went down and will continue to go down as people transition to electric vehicles and non-internal combustion engines. So if that's true, then how is it possible that we're using more oil? And the answer is plastics. Even though we recycle only 6% of our plastics, the use of plastics is exploding. It's especially exploding outside the United States because it's very cheap. There's all kinds of problems with infinite use of plastics. It doesn't biodegrade. We don't recycle it. We stick it into landfills. We send it to other countries who then put it in the ocean. We pay them so we have clean hands, but the result is the same. There's so many answers to that question, but it's going to have to be answered. Now, I can tell you, 
three or four different ways to address that problem. But there's no question that we have to address it. So there's that set of opportunities of things that have to happen today. How do you think about the other set? Well, there's the point. Then there's technologies where we can see, here's the technology. It's got to come down in price. It's got to win in the marketplace. You need a lot of reps to get that to happen. But you can see a decline curve to cost and where it's going to cross over with the dirty competitor and be cheaper, better, faster. So that if you're just a consumer and you don't know anything, it's cheaper, better, faster. Why would I not buy that? Oh, by the way, it's also cleaner. Great. That's even better. But that's not why I bought. And then there are the technologies that don't exist. An example that I think is a highly relevant one and one that people think about a lot, honestly, is nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion, a clean, non-emitting technology, safely done, can be done at a cost that is competitive with other sources of electricity, which would revolutionize a lot of them. And that's something which people have worked on for decades, and they feel as if there have been a lot of strides. There are probably 12 companies in America working on this. They've raised a bunch of money. I invested in one in 2006, just to put it in context. And I think people feel as if they can break through on the engineering in the next 10 years, then that would have real impact because then you have to site, build, plants. That takes a really long time. I'm sure there'd be a lot of pressure to do it faster. It takes a long time. It would have real impact starting in 2040. Look, if we aren't well on the way to solving this problem by 2040, we're going to be in a very tough spot, to say the least. There's different stages of deployment, improvement, creation. As you assessed the landscape for the different types of investment strategies that you wanted to pursue at Galvanize, where did you come out? The first stage is when it's an idea with an entrepreneur. Seed stage, most often pre-revenue. That is an area that we've done some work in and some investing in for the last over a year and a half. And that's something that I'm really interested in for a whole bunch of reasons, including the information you derive about where the future is looking, where the ideas are coming. And if you want to understand the trajectory of the business climate response, understanding the new ideas that are coming up from the smartest people is really helpful. It also can be, as in all investment areas, if you're doing it with really great people, you can get very good returns. But that's very early. The next stage is when you have a company that has revenue, it has a product market fit. But the question is, can you take it from very modest beginnings and really scale it so that it has real impact? Okay, we're very interested in that too. That's something where it's very hard to do. A lot of companies don't succeed in that. For new ideas that really answer or solve a real world problem, way that the world needs it to be solved. I always say it's a must-have business. If I go into your office, you need to have something you must have, not something that's, ah, it'd be great if we had it. No, that never works. Must have. So that's something we're also very interested in. Beyond that, one of the big questions is, what are we going to do with our existing buildings and infrastructure? What are we going to do? They emit a lot of CO2. Why is anyone ever going to fix that up? Because it costs money to fix up. So why are you going to do it? Are we going to have to pass laws that say that you can't do X, you can't do Y, you can't do Z? How is that going to work? And how are people ever going to figure that out? And so that's something we're really interested in. Is how do you do retrofits? Our basic thesis, you have to win in the marketplace. How do you win in the marketplace when you do a retrofit, but Ted Seides, that dirty little bum, refuses to do retrofits? For it to really happen, you have to be able to prove that you're going to be richer if you do the retrofit, then if you don't do the retrofit. And how are you going to make that happen? You can see the different stages of capitalism. I've talked about deployment, near-in, improvement of tech, creation of new tech. There's also a question of how are we going to influence our public market managements to try and make this part of their successful toolbox so that they're doing what I'm saying, which is acknowledging that Every decision has a climate impact to it, and that has to be taken into account, and it's part of their responsibility. Do I have to go say, if Ted Seides doesn't do this, we're going to vote him out at the shareholders meeting and cast him into a fiery furnace? Or is there a way to do this in a way so you have real impact? Because in the public market, 
if you own a thousand shares of IBM or I own a thousand shares of IBM, that doesn't make a heck of a lot of difference. How do we make a difference in that context to push public markets where the people generally have very diffuse shareholders? Is there a mechanism, an investment mechanism where you make more money and influence the pace of the transition, which is both critical? There's so many different places here. And I haven't even talked about infrastructure in India and the DRC. How does that really work from an investment standpoint? How is that an investment? Why do 90% of those people not have electricity? Because people didn't think it was get an investment return to build it. We're not doing infrastructure, but building infrastructure around the world clearly If you look at India, they're going to have five times as much electricity in 2050 as they have now. The infrastructure that is built to deliver that electricity to the world's most populous country, what gets built happens to matter quite a bit. I think the DRC has about 100 million people, the Democratic Republic of Congo, 10% of those people have access to electricity. So that means there's probably going to be a lot of electricity generation that's developed in the DRC over the next 30 years. And what the source of that is, people, an open air market in Lagos, Nigeria, they have their own diesel generators in each stall. And it turns out that a diesel generator, which of course is fossil fuel, and it also emits a lot of not particularly healthful emissions from burning the diesel but also is obviously a big emitter of CO2, costs 10 times as much per kilowatt hour as solar. It's not just the transition for us. We're thinking, oh yeah, the transition from my internal combustion engine to an EV. But the transition around the world may be very different than the one for people in the United States of America because we have multiples of the GDP per capita of a lot of countries. And a lot of those countries are going to be developing in many ways the kinds of lifestyle that we already have. And so how that goes is going to be a huge determinant of what the result of this is. This is global warming. And the United States has 330 million people out of 8 billion. You can do the math. So despite that, opportunity set, you've chosen not to pursue infrastructure investing. I wouldn't say that, Ted. I'd say this. If you think about it, put on your Yale investment office hat for one second. We probably did 20 financial services startups within the context of Fairline. We did a whole bunch of new markets. As I said, we'd move to new markets, new ideas, new verticals. Ted and Tom can't go, okay, now we're in the infrastructure business in Honduras. Excuse me. Do you speak Spanish? (laughs) Because last I checked, your Spanish is very, very bad. And by the way, do you know anything about infrastructure? Because last I checked, your idea of infrastructure is your garden hose. You can only do an investment activity if you have a great investment team. So you and I may really want to invest in something, but unless we have a team that can be leading, not okay, outstanding, fantastic, first class. You can't do it. And so in all of this, there's a question of how much can we do at any one time? We haven't decided not to do infrastructure. We've decided we can't do infrastructure right now because we don't have the team and the strategy where we go, okay, that's a strategy that makes sense and we can execute the heck out of it. So there's a lot of investment business questions here that I find incredibly interesting. And I find that measuring the impact in a discernible way, knowing that it's going to be imperfect and it's going to change, but that you can do is also critical. There's a, a task that will take more than till this Friday to complete. <laughs> there are two things you mentioned at the onset from your past investment experience. I'm really curious how you're applying it to this. The first is the environment we're in. You mentioned in the 70s, there was this period of hyperinflation. We're seeing the beginnings of inflation now. How do you think about the economic environment as it relates to these investment strategies? I love to think about the world in terms of alpha and beta. The beta is what you're talking about. How does the impact of all the different macro environmental influences change the returns? And how much is determined just by the success or lack of success of the specific company? Beta is always going to move around, and we know that. 
there's going to be slower growth out of China, faster growth out of China. There's going to be higher interest rates. There's going to be lower interest rates. There's going to be budget deficits. There's going to be hopefully smaller budget deficits. <laughs> I think that's a law of economics, but I guess we're going to find out if that still holds. But this is about alpha. I was talking about plastics. That has to get solved. Sorry. If you look at the impact of two degrees Celsius, what that even means, these are problems that we cannot allow to fester. They have to get solved. There's a bunch of different ways to solve them, and that's really a question. How do you take the pattern recognition from that Farallon experience and apply it to individual investments that have quite a different risk profile? This is still a mathematical formula in thinking about probabilities and success. And it's still about foreseeing the future. The way the returns happen in an early stage company where there's much higher chance that the company won't work, but if it does work, the returns are completely different as well. To me, this has always been about making judgments about what is likely to happen. And a lot of times, understanding the capabilities and psychology, dare I say, of the people who are leading the companies, overwhelmingly important. You guys used to do that at Yale. I mean, you had to figure out who are these people? What are they going to do in 1987? What are they going to do in a crisis? Because for sure, there's going to be a crisis. In early stage companies, you know it's not going to follow to their plan. Of course, it's not going to follow to their plan because the world's going to change. The opportunities change. Your capabilities change. The demands change. The risk change. And so when you think about early stage companies, that's the environment they're in. You think there are these immutable things that you will never do. But the truth is, it's really about leadership and being able to adapt to a changing environment and take advantage of. That looks bad to you, but actually that's really good for you. So when you think about young companies, the question is, are you going to have a team of people with leadership that can basically change, adapt to the changing world? There are going to be times when it just stinks and you're going to have to get through that. And that's just the way it goes. So the investment landscape changed so much from the early years where you were constantly having to find new strategies. And now you've been out of day-to-day investing for 10 years. As you've stepped back in, what have you seen as the most important changes that you've had to make in implementing investing from when you were last at the helm? Honestly, Ted, I don't see it as materially different. When I was under the age of 25, I felt that there were an infinite number of people who are very hardworking, very smart, very honest, and very dedicated to the task at hand. As I've gotten older, starting with, say, 26 in one day, (laughs) it's become clear that that's actually an unusual combination. You don't need to be a magician. You need to be a dedicated, high-integrity professional. I'm a real believer. I do think you have to have the intelligence and judgment. But basically, the old saying, the harder I work, the luckier I get. You are going to have to do the work so that when the real opportunity arrives, you know it's the real opportunity. Whereas if you haven't done the work, it's just another opportunity and you don't understand what creates real opportunity. To me, it's can you find, organize, ally yourself with, partner with, team up with those kind of people in a coherent way who can execute a strategy and then have a strategy that makes sense. That hasn't changed. How have you found the climate for building a new asset management company? Well, in terms of people, young people want to work in a climate response. First of all, I think this is going to affect every single person on this planet. So it's not like I'm saying, oh, this is going to affect my grandchildren. No, this is going to affect me. This is affecting me today. But I think young people have worried about this and thought about it for longer. And it's more in their bones that they cannot escape this. So responding to it is part of having a meaningful life. And not including this way of thinking for the last 200 years has got us where we are. I think the next generation understands that participating in the solution to this is an absolutely meaningful thing to do with your professional life. And they want their professional and personal life. So that's one thing that is a huge advantage for us. In any investment business, when you're starting, if it's a really terrible market, so people are depressed, outcomes are bad, people have lost money, it's hard to raise money. If it's an ebullient market, 
everything's gone great. People are fat and happy. It's hard to invest money. People are always going to complain about something. <laughs> <laughs> what have you found about willingness to put capital behind concepts that everybody nods their head about, about the importance of climate solutions? I used to go to Wall Street conferences in 2012, 13, 14, 15, and say, you need to take climate into account. This is going to change the world. It's going to change the investment world. I was like the two-handed man at the circus. People wanted to hear what I had to say because he's just so weird. We have previously thought that he was remotely intelligent, but I think we can prove to our own satisfaction that that is definitely not true if it ever was. <laughs> I think now it gets a spectrum, Ted. I'll give you the example. In the United States, if you talk to the huge asset gatherers, the Black Rocks, the Goldmans, if they get a new investment client, so they come in and they're going to have an investment advisor and they're going to allocate their portfolio, 10% of them want a so-called ESG overlay. In Europe, in Germany, the same number is 90%. So it depends how much, from a societal standpoint, people have bought into this is a must-have. And so we see it in various ways. It's all shades of gray that the people who are like, I absolutely insist on. And I say now, one of the things I say is having a fossil free portfolio, the divestment movement, I say, this is not the time for divest. This is the time for invest. The answer here is making profitable investments in the transition to make it happen faster and to ride the wave of demand that is that transition. But obviously there are people who don't believe that. I spoke to one big pension manager who said, my best investments this year were in oil and gas. And I was trying to be polite, so I didn't mention that his worst investments for the past 10 years, including that year, were oil and gas. <laughs> <laughs> the world you lived in at Farallon, to some extent, particularly in the, on the public market side, is always thought of as a zero-sum game. And as you're espousing the importance and necessity of making these investments, it has a degree of a positive sum element to it. I'd love to hear how you think about the nature of competition, how your competitive drive, if at all, has shifted in your day-to-day -day investing. Ted, I'm shocked to hear you think I'm competitive. It's very upsetting <laughs> to me. Look, we don't want to do anything that doesn't have impact, but we believe that in order for it to scale, it has to be successful economically. My competitive feelings about returns haven't changed an iota, not an iota. There's the substantive change that we can make in specific companies and specific outcomes and specific impacts. Okay. And then there's the point we're making. This is how it has to go and you're going to get paid for doing it. So even if you don't care one bit, if you don't do it, you're an idiot. Our family has a regenerative cattle range. We wanted to prove you could raise cattle in a way that net sequesters carbon. And it's part of a much broader regenerative agriculture movement in the US and around the world. Our goal in that always was to develop techniques that other people would want to adopt and do better at. We couldn't change the world from our ranch, but hopefully we could influence other ranches in a way so that animals were raised chain would be net much healthier, would restore the souls. There's a whole bunch of positives to regenerative ag, but it was always about influencing other people by showing what was possible. Tom, I've got a quick set of closing questions to ask you, and then we'll wrap up. What is your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? Sports. I get more than an hour of aerobic exercise virtually every day more than 365 times a year. And a lot of it's tennis. Occasionally it's mountain climbing, which I've gotten much slower at to my distress. Some of it's water skiing, but I feel like that's the thing that I just get a huge kick out of. What type of investment do you gravitate to like a moth to the flame? So the investment that I like the most is the one where you look at it and say that makes absolute, complete, convincing sense and no one else believes it. That is my idea of real conviction at odds with accepted wisdom. That's my idea of a great investment. What's your biggest investment pet peeve? People who assume the status quo is forever. I remember in 2012, 
talking to a guy who ran a Fortune 25 company and had run another Fortune 25 company. And he asked me how I thought that the electricity pie chart would change over the next 20 years, so by 2030. And I gave him, I thought, a stock response. Was basically a lot more renewables, a lot less coal, natural gas probably stays the same. And he looked at me and said, I don't think that any of the pie slices will change by a percent. And I said, you could be right. But if that's true, that's the end of the world. So I'm assuming you're wrong. <laughs> he just assumed the status quo was forever. And that was his basis. Come on, man. That's a 0% probability. Which two people have had the biggest impact on your professional life? Let me say this. In terms of people who are professional counterparts or partners for me, the three people who were in senior positions and really impacted me were Bob Rubin, Warren Hellman, and David Swenson, who was the head of the Yale Investment Office. But in terms of the people who really shaped the way I think about work and what you're trying to accomplish through your work life, it's really my father and my maternal grandfather both of whom were incredibly serious about their careers, incredibly serious about integrity, and incredibly determined to have an impact broadly within their chosen field. When I think about what I've been trying to do, I've been trying to be half as good as they were. What was the most challenging moment in your career? <laughs> Leaving Goldman. Because I had thought that it was going to be very, very friendly and that they would think he's going to be a future client. He's done a good job for us. We're personal friends. This is a natural thing to have happen, but we'll continue to work together and we'll be close allies. That's honest to gosh what I thought. So when I went in to say I was going to leave, I said, look, I understand that I'm responsible for half the positions in this department. And I don't want to screw you in any way. So if you want me to stay for six months and work out my positions, happy to do it. Whatever's going to make it okay for you guys, I'm going to do. And the guy goes, do you think you could be out of here in 15 minutes? 15 minutes. Let me ask you a question. Do I get to say goodbye to my friends? And he goes, no, I want you out of here in 15 minutes. That gives you time to go back to your desk, get your stuff and get out of here. So I've been exile. I was really shocked. I honestly thought it would be 180 degrees different from that. How'd you handle it? I got out of there in 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and I moved to the West Coast two weeks later. I was unable to see how they would see me. To me, I had a job. I'd done a good job for them. I was going to do something different. I wasn't rejecting them. I thought, in fact, we were going to end up being close allies, which by the way, we ended up being close allies. But it took five years before they accepted me back in the fold. And then over time, I was Goldman's biggest clearing customer. And we were back to being what I originally thought they'd do on day one. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? So my parents were ridiculous sticklers for honesty and were very judgmental about it. So that if you were dishonest with my parents, it was like a life sentence. <laughs> that was an unforgivable fact. But the other thing that I find in thinking about my parents, especially my mom, she saw something through society's baloney. I said to my mom in 1989, my mother's very religious. So I said, mom, do you believe in the death penalty? And I knew what she was going to say. She was going to say, don't believe in the death penalty because I believe in the sanctity of life and the redemption of the human soul. And that's not a appropriate way for someone who loves God to think. She goes, no, I don't believe in the death penalty. I said, why not? She goes, because I don't think they're guilty. I think that a bunch of those people on death row are innocent. And once you've killed them, then there's no coming back. You've committed murder yourself as a society. So I'm 100% against the death penalty. I'm like, mom, they get 17 appeals. It gets litigated <laughs> and litigated. She goes, that's a bunch of baloney. A bunch of the evidence in there is baloney. And they get railroaded and there are a bunch of people on death row who I'm pretty sure are innocent. I'm thinking, oh man, what a soft-headed, chuckle-headed lady my mom is. Dead right. No one was saying. And she did that over and over where she just cut through all the jargon and all of the cant and all of the fake sanctimonious stuff. 
to what's the truth. And I just really appreciate that. All right, Tom, last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? I think the thing that I've learned is the way that we used to define intelligence is somewhat relevant, but way too narrow. It's a cliche to say that there are a lot of different kinds of intelligence. And I think that's true. But I think more than that, intelligence itself is overrated. The, the ability to put yourself in other people's places, that doesn't show up on your SAT. The ability to look into the future realistically doesn't show up on your SAT. An internal sense of decency, that doesn't show up on your SAT. And I think that the way that American society, and including me, looked at your measurable scores was disproportionate. As I said, I think it matters, but I also am much more aware of the value of different positive parts of people and that the lack of those positive parts is a huge problem. Counting too much the traditional measures of intelligence and success and isn't there something much broader than that that includes a lot of things that are never counted in those tests and those measures that actually reflect much more your contribution as a person. Tom, it's so great to see you after all these years. And thanks so much for sharing both incredible past and success and exciting things you're working on to keep moving the climate in the right direction. It's nice to see you, Ted. It really has been a long time. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one and see you next time.